guy. He was queer, and the body was high. Turns out he was Dracula. Came all the way from Transylvania. Then I saw this other dude. He would talk, and I thought was real rude. Turns out he was a creature who had big bolts on his neck as a feature. They were classic monsters, just like you see in the textbooks, just where they used to be. Frankenstein and the Dracula, that's what I was told today on the Supercast. Welcome back to the Supercast, everybody. I'm your host, the man who put the super in Supercast, the Super Foch. But I'm joined, as always, by my buddy and co-host... Steve Z, the man who put the Z in Supercast. And it is officially Halloween season, everybody. It is yeah. October, it is fall, it is just one of the best times of the year. Wouldn't you agree, sir? Definitely. I like it because... The leaves are already starting to change. Nope. We've had a few cool mornings. Right. And even today, it barely got up to 80. It was a little bit cooler, some nice wind. And I like it because as we're getting into with our show, we're getting into some spooky films. Yes. And while I did not grow up as a horror fan that much, I liked a few films. I have definitely became a horror fan in my 30s. And I think that's cool. I think that's all right to, to become later in life a fan of of a genre of film so yeah i mean it's the same thing we were talking about um just my experience with like musicals or westerns or something like that a little late to the game but hey as long as you like them and you get into them eventually yeah that's where it's at better late than never i always say and Mm -hmm. what a way to kick off spooky season and our movie our spooky movie series than looking at some classic horror films and uh dude i know you grew up with these i had seen these on tv different times are you excited to talk about these films as much as i am man because i am literally just really excited about this episode i am i got into universal monsters i guess it was like my second grade year or third yeah. grade um there were some yeah. books in the library that just talked about old monster mm-hmm. movies and stuff and that's actually my first um, connection with Godzilla was from those books. Um, but they had one on pretty much every one of the Universal Monsters. And I remember checking those out pretty much every week when I went to the library. And eventually they came out. I remember going to Suncoast Videos and seeing ah, those when they were first released on VHS. Yeah. And it was a big deal because it was like a really cool covers. There was a whole series of them. Unfortunately, I only bought like three of them, yeah, but <laughs> it'd been cool to have the whole thing, and I still want to get that that whole 30 film Blu-ray collection they have. Um, but I, I've always liked these films. They're they're short, they're sweet, they're to the point, and as I've gotten older, I realize they're very effective. Hmm, big time. That's probably a word we'll probably use a lot in this episode, just because of how effective these films are. Now, we're talking about two classics on this episode. Why don't you introduce the two films for us, buddy? So these are the two films that started the Universal Monsters. And it's when you look at it, it's, it's, it's actually what a lot of people say is the original MCU. <laughs> the, yeah. There's films are all connected. Yeah. They, they have sort of formula to them. And they were big time money makers back in the day. Right. And these two came out. I mean, it's it's crazy when you think about it. Yeah. These are over ninety years old now. Wow. They came out in nineteen thirty one. So Dracula was the first one, um, starring mm. the great Bella Lugosi, and it's it got an interesting story yeah. behind it. I can't wait to get into that. Um, but we also have 
also from 1931, they just rushed into production, Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff as the monster, or as they say in the credits, <laughs> question That's mark. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So these movies, like you said, are very much classics, and I had a really good time watching these again. I've always been a fan of both of these, and it just, you know, these films have a different tone, I, I, I would say. A little bit. But very much give you the same... Uh, for me, for my experience watching these films, give me the same emotions, you know, kind of thing. And um, obviously the stories are different and the characters are a bit different, but I do feel like that these two films do connect, uh, strangely enough, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think they do. I mean, the look of them, pretty similar. I would say that yep. Frankenstein leads a little bit more into, like, sort of the German expressionism mm -hmm. with its yep. sets designs. Little, yeah. I don't want to say less realistic, but definitely based <laughs> in a different place. And yeah. um, Dracula is it's definitely gothic. It's just like, yeah, we're in these cavernous rooms, castles, all that stuff. Mm. Um, so they're... They're definitely works of art. They they stand the test of time, in my opinion. And uh, I think a big part of it is just the filmmaking that goes into that. Uh, just the, yep. the lighting, the direction, the, the just the interesting things it does. But of course, the great performances from the two leads. Mm. So let's get into it. I'm, I'm ready to start off yeah, with Dracula. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think I'm going to give you the wheel on this one. Lead us so okay. through this great film. Uh, so, Dracula is, again, one, one of the first movies. Yeah, this one came out, and then a few months later we had Frankenstein. And so, Dracula was, of course, from a book. And, uh, of course, Bram Stoker wrote the book and uh, many years before this film came out. But I don't think this film is 100% faithful to the original novel, is it? Not I think at all. It took, no. took a lot of uh, creative license. Uh, for the film. Yeah. And it's kind of kind of interesting story behind it because mm -hmm. um, in the 20s, um, really one of my favorite versions of this story was mm -hmm. made in 1924. It's uh, Nosferatu. Yeah. And that one's an unofficial adaptation of Dracula. Right. Um, the Bram Stoker's widow would not give the rights to the filmmakers. So they just... Huh. Made their own version. They just like took some of the characters, just changed their names. Like Count Dracula mm -hmm. became Count Orloff, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But it doesn't really follow the. I mean, other than the everybody on the boat getting killed and all that stuff, yeah. it doesn't follow it too much. Yeah. Um, same thing with this one. This one makes Renfield a lot bigger character. Um, it mm -hmm. also definitely streamlines the whole story. I mean, we also watched the. The Coppola version, which it's a lot closer to the book, um, but this right. one in particular, they just they kind of go nuts with it, and they definitely the character of Dracula is totally different yeah. than he is in the book. Yeah. Some of those things I would say are good changes. It's mm. definitely for the audience, and yeah. um, I think a big part of that was it was a, it, this book was adapted for stage first. So this one's actually closer to the play of the time period of the 20s, which Lugosi actually played Dracula on Broadway, and that's something that gave him a leg up on getting this part. And you know, when you watch this film, if you didn't know that it came from a play, which I did because I had done a little bit of research myself, um, it really does watch like a play. It really does. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think sometimes you get sort of an intimacy and I think that's that's something about this film that surprised me watching it this past time is how intimate this film is and mm -hmm. how you know just really into the world you get with these characters and of course that's the performances and as you mentioned all the goth stuff and everything but also I think how it is staged and how it's blocked as we say in the play world and uh, you know it, it really does Kind of feel like a play so that's that's an interesting point to make right there yeah and i think all the actors involved mm -hmm. here they are probably more stage yep. actors or they're coming from the silent era because this is 1931 this is early talkies as they early would say talkies, yeah and that's why it seems like a lot of the action um or the acting is 
It's kind of <laughs> over the top. It's <laughs> it's kind of we're playing for like like we went for the stage. You exactly. got to make it to where everybody can see what you're doing. Same thing on this. Um, you're if you're used to pantomiming all your movements, yep. you're not really adopting the subtleties that you see in modern films as, right. when it comes to acting. So, but I think that's a definitely something to bring up when you look at this. And I, I think one other thing is just from some people when they watch this for the first time, mm -hmm. it's very unsettling because mm -hmm. there's no score to it. That's right, and that's was one of the things of the time period that um, showed you that A, they were trying to save money and mm -hmm. B, it, it was just something that wasn't done for films of this nature. Right. And that, I don't know, How do you, what do you think about that? You know, um, obviously we're both fans of movie scores and I think that uh, a good score can really ele elevate a good movie to a great movie. Uh, having said that, I think for this film, I think that it's okay. I think that it kind of adds to the spookiness and the creepiness of who this character is. Because obviously, Bela Lugosi is Dracula. I mean, he is Dracula from the word go. And you don't question it. You know, it's kind of like when you see Michael Keaton as Batman in, in 89 Batman. You're like, that's Batman. This, this is Dracula. So I don't think you ne necessarily need the music to kind of tell you, oh, this is who this is. Um, so I kind of like it. And again, that's someone that loves musical scores, um, but it didn't bother me uh, as much as it might have in something else. Yeah, a lot of people say it makes it more unsettling. That uh, Right. I, I would agree with that 100%. Like some of the scenes with the long takes, they, mm. they just seem that much longer because there is no music. And I, I definitely hear your points, and I see that, too. I've watched it this time, actually, without the music, um, mm -hmm. because on the DVD I have, um, there's a version that has Philip Glass and his orchestra performing mm -hmm. a score, and it's just a string quartet. It's mainly just yeah. background music to help it, like, flow yep. better. Yep. I prefer that version. That's just me personally. No, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's fine. I do like what it is, and I know on the, the new 4Ks, that they have that hissing mm -hmm. sound is like seems like it's amplified if you know what i'm talking about it's the hissing of the microphone you can yeah. hear it a little bit on these old films like mm -hmm. this but <laughs> just be rare yep. for that if you've never seen this film before it's a definitely <laughs> little i mean it's old filmmaking like it's 90 years old it's it's amazing yeah. we still have the prints and we can watch it in 4k yeah that, that that's pretty awesome that is really cool yeah so that's really cool i guess we'll Get into the plot a little bit and then get into the other mm -hmm. stuff. So, um, it tells the story about Dracula, as you probably would guess. And Dracula is met by our buddy Renfield, who mm. starts off in a carriage and he's visiting the old land of Transylvania. Let me tell you, first of all, before we get started, I love the performance of the guy uh, that plays Renfield. I think he is yeah. my favorite character in this. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about. Bela Lugosi's Dracula, and for good reason. He's great. He carries his film. He's amazing. But I think it overshadows the performance of Renfield because I think you need a character like Renfield to make the character of Dracula that much better. Um, obviously, um, Dracula wants someone like Renfield to turn him into what he is, to what he becomes. By the way, this, as uh, Steve mentioned, this movie's and years old, we're gonna spoil the heck out of it. So if you don't want to get spoiled by by Dracula or Frankenstein when we talk about it, go ahead and stop this now and just wait to watch it because it's worth the wait. Believe me. But um, but Renfield uh, shows up and he's just this normal. He's pretty straight laced. He's you know he's in a nice suit on and everything. He looks like a normal guy. But over the course of his visit with uh, Dracula he slowly slips into madness and I think his performance is in my opinion not praised enough uh, because I think he's just fantastic in this film yeah I totally agree I, I love Dwight Fry as Renfield because mm. um, like you said we see this transformation he starts off he's very confident he's like I'm just gonna go do some business and all yeah. the people are saying don't go don't go it's dangerous yeah. don't go to the castle and mm -hmm. 
Sure enough, he does, and comes into contact with our our spooky little carriage guy. Um, <laughs> and at that point, his alarms are going off a little bit. He's a little apprehensive, um, especially yep. when we start seeing werewolves and stuff like that. Or actually, I guess they're not werewolves, just scary looking wolves. Yeah. And then gets to the castle, and it's just one of those things where, yeah, he's got a job to do, but he's definitely getting freaked <laughs> out by all the stuff in Dracula's castle, and um, gets transformed into this weird guy that just eats insects and serves his master. So, <laughs> but I love his performance. It's definitely over the top. Yep. Definitely unhinged. And that's what you need out of this character. Exactly. And I again, I think he, he kind of his performance as it slowly goes into this madness you know it kind of shows because he's basically a normal guy at the beginning like he's just uh you know he's not necessarily stupid he's not necessarily an idiot he's just a normal guy you know he might be a little weak-minded and probably that's why that dracula can kind of overtake him uh more than other people that he because he tries to do that with a couple other people and it doesn't quite work but it does with renfield <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he can pretty much get everybody except Van Helsing, but yep. get to him later. So, yeah. Classic story. Mm -hmm. Dracula's buying a property in London. He travels to London, and he I don't know if he falls in love so much with, with Lucy and Mina, but definitely films two girls that he likes yeah. that he wants to turn over to his side. So it's just basically Dracula mm -hmm. making the life rough for these, these sort of socials of uh, London. <laughs> And it's just a very interesting film to watch. It moves so quickly. Mm -hmm. It's just one minute you're in the carriage, the next minute you're at the castle, or you know it, you're in London, and then <laughs> credits. Yeah, there's no pacing issues with this film. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't take that long. And again, I think that that's sort of like a play where you kind of have to condense everything and shorten everything so that you don't have these long, drawn-out scenes and... And I think that's another reason why there's probably not much of a score, just because it wouldn't fit in a film uh, that goes as fast as this. I, I think that was probably another thing that they probably thought that, hey, you know, this, move, this film moves kind of quickly, and it's scary enough. I mean, the imagery alone and, and, and the way uh, Dracula is throughout the film is unsettling enough. So um, I think that's an interesting part, too to talk about is the pacing and how fast a movie like this goes. Yeah, and speaking of which, you brought up the man himself, Dracula, mm. his performance. What do you think about Bella's performance? Look, I mean, you know, and we'll get into another performance of Dracula here in a bit, um, and I take nothing away from that performance, but this, this to me, when you say the word Dracula, this is what you think of. This is... The original version. Now I know it's not necessarily faithful to the book, and uh, Gary Oldman's uh, rendition is more faithful to the book. But I think if you just ask anybody off the street, you know, uh, who is Dracula, they would point to a picture of Bela Lugosi if you had one. So uh, I think he's very iconic. I I love his speech uh, for a film <laughs> that moves quickly. He does speak very slowly, uh, which is an unsettling thing. I, I just think he's great, and I've watched different documentaries on Bella, and I think for a while after he did this film, he was sort of trying to distance him, distance himself from it because he was kind of being typecast in this part, but I think by the end of his life, he really kind of embraced the whole character and that for so many people, uh, you know, this is Dracula. I, I don't think another care another actor could have played Dracula as good as Bella Lugosi did at this point in time. Yeah, and he made this part his. Yes. He is the guy and it's kinda rare for somebody to mm -hmm. basically tap into the zeitgeist, if you will, that mm -hmm. much where he becomes just popular culture himself, his <laughs> performance does. Yeah. And that's what we got and it's the whole package. It's the the saying of the lines. Mm -hmm. It's the facial expressions. I, I mean, I love his eyes. I think that's the yes. the highlight for me is yes. what he does with his eyes. And mm. the filmmakers definitely play into that. They right. they like to zoom in on them. They yeah. light on them at certain times. 
Um, but even just his mannerisms, his oh, just yeah. like the way he moves, the way he positions his hands. I know some people think it's kind of hokey at times, especially when he does his hands like in that weird sort of like I'm gonna hypnotize you. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's a great performance. It's it's really good and it's really neat that how he actually did it. Like I was reading that he's pretty much method acting on set. He he -hmm. shows up and he just tells everybody hi Mm -hmm. like how's it going good morning and then he would just kind of stick to himself Mm -hmm. the whole time and just do his lines freak people out definitely made the the female (laughs) stars kind of uncomfortable at times i guess and then um yeah yeah he he just nails the part he's he's great and i yeah i think he his career could have gone so many different other directions if he would have totally embraced it i think Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I'm I'm glad he challenged himself as an artist and tried to take on different roles. You know, and that's the thing. I, I see it as someone that's acted, obviously, am- amateurishly, but someone that, you know, you, you don't want to play the same part all the time. And I get that 100%. But I think that with a part like this that's so iconic, you know, I think eventually he realized he was never going to fully get away from it. And that he was never going to fully, um, you know, there were not going to ever be people that just saw him as anything but Dracula. So, you know, to kind of embrace it toward the end of his life, I think is um, very admirable. And I think he is a fine actor no matter what he does. But I think this performance would really be different had it been some other actor coming into this role. Yeah. The last guy I want to talk about is Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing. And I think once again we have the stereotypical yeah. performance of this character. I think Van Helsing is another character that gets overshadowed by Dracula's performance. I think maybe not so much as, as Renfield, but I think definitely he's one of those characters that uh, is pushed to the side a little bit. I think he's fantastic in this film. I think his interpretation is really really good I think the uh, character that he kind of comes to try to be sort of the the go-between of crazy uh, Renfield and Dracula I guess I don't don't know what what I'm trying to say but uh, I think his performance is is I think it fits at the time he comes into the film and I think it's not over the top as much as people might say um, like some other performances Uh, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't remember it as much as I did uh, when I watched this film last. So it was kind of nice to be re, re, um, reminded of this character and this performance. And I think it's uh, a really good performance, for sure. Yeah, and I think, once again, we have a case where a guy played it on the stage, and now he mm-hmm. gets to play it in the film. And I think he does really well. I, I don't think he was happy with his performance. From what I read, he mm. he was just kind of like uh, didn't do that good of a job. But they he also wasn't happy with the script how they took out the big mirror scene, um, sort of like yeah. if you remember Dracula Dead and Loving It, that was in the play and in the book the big yes. mirror sc- scene. But they they toned yeah. it down a lot. They're just like let's just have a little mirror in his hand. <laughs> but Van Helsing, he's very he's you have to have a Dracula movie with Van Helsing and. Yeah, definitely. Although he's not my favorite, I'll, I'll get into we'll get into Sir Anthony Hopkins later. Talk about his performance. Mm. I'd like it mm-hmm. a little bit more than this one, but I would say the actor did the best he could, and I think he nails the accent. He nails the the part because mm-hmm. he's a very important part. Like you were saying, he he's kind of like the yeah. translator for this weird supernatural world for the rest of everybody else because yep. nobody else knows anything about vampires. It just seems like, what right. are you even talking about, buddy? Um, and he's a scientist, too, so he, he has some credibility to him. He's not just some crazy guy on the street saying, oh, vampires are going to destroy us. Yeah. But let's, let's, what do you think works about this film? Dude, everything works about this film, in my opinion. I think, as we said at the top, you know, the way this movie is shot, the way the action is choreographed with... With, uh, you know, some of it looks kind of silly, yes, I, I will give you that. But I think that you have to, as we've said before with other films that we've 
uh, talked about that are years and years old, you kind of have to put yourself back in that time period. Yes, the 2022 eyes, a 1930s film, is going to look a little bit silly. Sure. But at the same time, if you think about when this was made, this frightened people. This kept people up at night, you know. And I think if I'd, if I saw this movie, uh, you know, at that time period, I'd probably be right there with them. So um, I think this movie still works from a, uh, you know, it's still entertaining. Whether it's scary or not, you know, that's, that's I guess, up to the viewer. But I think it's entertaining, and I think that's the point of a film, is it not? To be entertained, and um, there's no doubt from a entertaining standpoint that that's what you get with these with this film. And um, I think Bella Lugosi has a memorable performance that we're still talking about almost a hundred years later. Same with Renfield and uh, the rest of them. So I think when you use a term like classic on a film I think that it has to stand not only a few years of time but many years of time and this movie definitely has done that and the fact that you and I are still doing a show on this you know 90 years on and that we love it as much as we do and that we know other people do too you know that's what makes this film as great as it is it's, it's a classic it is uh, going to be talked about in my opinion I, I guarantee you in a hun another hundred years they'll still be talking about this film yeah I just have this I just have this feeling they'll, they'll still be doing shows about Dracula in 1930s <laughs> yeah and I think it's the what works for me is just the look of it um, mm -hmm. just the overall tone that gets established early on yes. that stays with the whole way through it's like you said, it would be very thrilling to see this on the on the screens back in the 30s. They 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 yeah. lost it. I mean, people were like passing out in the theater because it was so <laughs> freaky to them. And I guess yeah, Dracula. He's a great character because he's the gentleman, um, but he's a monster mm -hmm. underneath that. So I guess yep. that's what this film's trying to say is like, hey, don't judge a book by its cover. He might look charming. He might put up the good front. He seems like he's part of the good social circles. But, hey man, this guy's bad news. I mean, you know, you see a character like Michael Myers, he's got a mask on that looks horrible. You know he's a bad dude. You see somebody in a suit, and he's got slick back hair. Now, we might now have our reservations, but back then that was just the way people dressed. You know? So, I mean, he was very probably uh, inviting at the... At some point, and then, nope. <laughs> yeah, it's just a great film. Let's let's move it into our good. other one. I didn't. We talked about that one a good bit, but that this one we could also talk about this one a good bit. Yes, we can. So Frankenstein's the other one we're putting in this double feature, and the reason why mm -hmm. is I I wanted to group these together because not only could they come out in the same year, they have they're part of the same series, but they're also very short. You could watch them back to back, and if you do that. I did not, but I know some people that do that. It's really cool. It's, it's a neat experience. This movie is, uh, you know, as Steve said, it came out the same year, but this is obviously a very different film. Um, this is more of a science fiction film, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, it is hard too, but I think this is almost the birth of science fiction because of the plot of the story. And just real quick, if you do not know the plot of Frankenstein, uh, go ahead and fill in our uh, lovely audience. Yeah, so based off of the book by Mary Shelley, this one, just like the Dracula, it does not follow the book at all, other than the general plot of Frankenstein, who's not the monster, um, but Victor Frankenstein is a guy that is obsessed with the idea of basically creating life out of nothing, out of dead tissue. So in this case, Calvin Clive is Frankenstein, he and his assistant, Fritz, go around, they find bodies, they put it together, and he's going to bring this thing to life. And he brings it to life. And only problem is, he bites off a little more than he, he can chew. And I think that's kind of the big thing here, is he was trying to play God, and it doesn't yeah. work out too well for him. And I, I think that's probably my favorite part of it, is, is seeing... Yeah. 
Colin Clive as Victor and just seeing how into it he is. He's just like, this is his dream. This is his passion. And I think he's a little deluded at everything. Like everybody around him is saying, that's a bad idea, man. That's that's not good. But he's just like, oh, you guys don't know. You don't understand. And even when the the creature is reanimated and he's he's around, he's just like a, enamored by he's like this like a work of art. This thing is great. Everybody else looks at it and they say, this thing is grotesque. This is a monster. And up until the end, it seems like he wants to save it. He wants to prove himself right. And um, it's just really tragic seeing this happen to this character. To me, it's almost kind of like what happens to Renfield in Dracula. You have this guy that he was probably just an, a smart medical person that might have had some out there ideas, but most everybody goes has out there ideas at some point. But this is really out there. Grant you. <laughs> Trying to reanimate dead life. I get that. Um, and we would know, because not to do that, that they probably would not end well. But this guy is so obsessed. So I think that's an interesting uh, note. But it's funny that you mentioned, and also that you said that Frankenstein's not the monster. But is he? But is he? Mm. You get it? Like, is... Is the dude sort of, uh, I mean, is, is, because again, no normal person would be like, yeah, let's take a dead body that's already been buried, dig him up, put him on a slab, throw him up into the heavens, and see if lightning can make him come back to life. 9.5 out of 10 people would probably be like, yeah, that's not smart. <laughs> so. Yeah. And he's definitely crazy. He's yeah. off, he's off his rocker. Um, I guess you could argue that if he doesn't do this, <laughs> then he, pretty much everybody's life would be better because of it. Mm. Um, because he does this, mm. he makes things worse for the creature. The creature, mm. he shouldn't be around. No. I mean, I'm surprised he doesn't just like start freaking out when he's been brought alive. He's like, I'm supposed to be dead. Yeah. This is tearing my soul apart. Um, but even he... Is like, why am I here? And Frankenstein does not do a good job at, of instructing this creature. No. He just tells it. He, he thinks he can just order it around and tell it what to do. He's like, sit down. Stand mm. up. Yeah. And stay in my castle. Uh, it's just, you can't do that with a person. You have to, like, if this is really your kid, if you will, that you brought into the world, you have to raise them. And he does not. He just puts it in the cell. Eventually he gets out and he does not understand how the world works and that's really with the the tragedy of this character mm. i love boris mm. karloff as the creature um he is like a a poor little demented kid that everybody just hates him and he's just like mm. i don't know how to react mm. i guess i'll be violent it's 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 a this is a tragedy film for me this is a this is as much as the other one is a horror film and has a lot of you know scary imagery this has a lot of tragedy in it and first of all creating life out of something that's dead to me is a tragedy i mean yeah you want to bring somebody that your grandpa dies you want to bring him back to life but you can't do that that there's no you, you just can't do that so we don't what this guy tries to do is break those rules. That's kind of the rules of society, you know. It's the rules of the universe. So it's kind of like it's kind of like what uh, 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 Doctor Malcolm says in Jurassic Park. You know, you spend all the time thinking how you do this. Should you do this? So even if even if uh, Frankenstein, the doctor, uh, knew exactly how to do this and it was going to be perfect. Should he have done this in the first place? I don't no. think so. No, I, I guess that's the big message. Uh, but it's of many messages. I think this one's a little bit deeper than our other one. I yes. still think they're both married together by the the great set design. Oh, I agree, yeah. I think mm -hmm. that was actually what made me fall in love with this film the first time I watched it. Or, yeah, it's just the, the fact that we're on a sound stage, but it looks like something mm -hmm. just out of a nightmare or something it's just the sets are so real and just the way they have it lit it's just amazing looking 
Um, yep. But I want to get back to Karloff. I, I think his performance. Oh, I love Karloff. I mean, obviously it's classic. Um, he has no real spoken parts in this one, and that was a big change they made from the book to the film. Mm. In the book, he learns to talk. He learns to like express himself. Um, in this one, he is just a poor, uh, just guy. He just he's a hulking, brutish thing. Yeah. That just reacts, and um, the to me the scene that is probably his. Mm. He's got two scenes that just really stand off in my mind. Mm. Um, the first one, we get to see him, um, mm -hmm. where he just kind of moonwalks into the room, and then they do that mm -hmm. like weird sort of jump cuts to zoom in on his face. Yeah. But I love that. And then we get to see mm -hmm. him like seeing the sun for the first time. Yeah. I mean, his reaction is awesome. And mm. um, that one and the one with the little girl, those are my two oh, favorite God. scenes. I think Karloff yeah. is just top of his game in that one because. He doesn't have the, I would say, advantage that Lugosi had. He has no mm -hmm. lines that he can express himself. He has to do it all physical. And I think that's, that's pretty hard to do, especially under all that makeup. That's what I was going to say, because you mentioned that he didn't have any speaking lines. So you, you would normally, with him not being able to talk, you would normally not know necessarily what he's thinking, but the way he moves, the way he looks... You can pretty much read what's going on. Like, he is a scared, and I even hate to say it like this, but it's really the only way. He's a scared animal, you know? Mm -hmm. he, is, he is extremely frightened. Um, I wonder, because you don't know, does he know he was a man? Because obviously this was a person, and he obviously was a criminal uh, kind of thing, but... He has no memory of that, or at least he doesn't show he has a memory of anything. So he's just literally an animal, and for someone uh, as wonderful after as Boris Karloff is, he really portrays that very well, what that would look like, in my opinion. I think that his performance is extremely deep. I think it's a very deep for any time period, let alone, you know, in the 30s. When this came out, I think it's it's um, sad. It's uh, it's just it's a powerful performance. Yeah. I mean, we feel for him every scene he's in, even Definitely. when he's doing bad stuff. I mean, I guess we could say the same yeah. thing for Dracula. Um, yeah, <laughs> he does some terrible things in this film. He he kills people, but at the same time, he's generally not planning it out like. Fritz, he kills right. Fritz, who's also Dwight Fry back again, mm. or Mr. Renfield's playing a hunchback in this one. That's right. I knew he looked familiar. I didn't realize it until that he made that one face when he's like looking up ha. at the hangman. I was like, that's the same face yeah. as Renfield. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. Fritz gets killed because he tortures the monster. He's whipping him and putting yeah. the fire in his face. I mean, I don't blame the creature there. Mm. And the little girl, yeah. he kills her because... He thinks she's going to float, just like the flowers. And um, yeah. it's just really sad seeing this happen to this character. And if this did have a sequel, this would be the end of it. He just dies at the end. <laughs> and this yeah. flaming inferno, this this windmill that gets burned up. And it's, it's just terrible because mm -hmm. the whole world was pretty much against him from the get-go. And he just didn't have a chance. And I, I love that we get that in this performance. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's a really deep, it's a really uh, emotional, like, I didn't remember all the emotions you go through watching this film, because it's, I mean, it is it is sad, and like the little girl scene um, that you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a tough watch there, because again, he's not being a vicious tiger that's just running into her, he's just, he's like a little kid, he's like a little... Um, child that doesn't know his own strength. I mean, he's a super child, obviously, because he's a big hulking dude. Um, and it's just, it's, it's such a powerful performance, and I don't think that you could say enough good stuff about what Boris Karloff does for this character, because as much as I think that Bela Lugosi really encapsulated Dracula, I think, um, obviously, Boris Karloff did for this role enough to bring him back as far as the look of him 
and the monsters, you know, what, 30 years later, whatever it was, and I actually heard that um, Boris Karloff's daughter got to see that and was, like, all excited about that. They, he would really appreciate that, that they took the look from his movie into this, and because when you see that character, you know exactly who that is. That's Frankenstein's monster. It's, it's, there's no confusion on that, so... I think a lot of that has to do with the makeup people and the way they design the character, but also for the performance of uh, Mr. Karloff. Yeah. A lot of this film, it just works. It's got the great atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I would say this one, as I was saying earlier, I think this one's a little bit deeper, a little more of a thinking man's film um, than mm -hmm. Dracula. Dracula's more of like a thrill ride. See this monster yep. in action. But this one definitely gets into some deeper stuff about human nature creation all that stuff mm. there are a few things that don't work for me in this one and that's really any scene that does not involve frankenstein or the monster i think all those other scenes with just these characters mm. that i didn't even put in our script um they're kind of flat those scenes just kind of yeah. like oh tell me what's going on with victor let's go find out it's just kind of like basic it's just like we're just having to put these in here otherwise the movie doesn't make much sense and I don't think the performances are great. I don't think mm. they really add much to the film. Um, that's my only major critique is some of the the stuff just seems like it's padding almost. It's like, okay, yeah. especially the, the wedding scene in particular when it has like the dad is <laughs> like, I'm so happy my son's about to get married. And yeah. all that stuff. I mean, I, I guess people at the time, they needed that extra levity, this comedic character. Um, but yeah. to me, he, um, Mr. Frank, or the Baron Frankenstein, he does not add anything to this film. No, I agree with you on that. Um, yeah, I kind of actually had forgotten about all that until you mentioned it. And I remember thinking that, okay, yeah, okay, all right, whatever. But I don't think it hurts the film. I don't think it ruins it. I don't think it's, you know, but I agree. If we're going to say something's bad, you know, it'd probably be that. So I agree with you on that. Yeah, but I didn't mention it with the other film, but definitely with this one. Both of them have these awesome climaxes. Mm -hmm. uh, just edge of your seat stuff the yeah. last 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, this is just one of the best scenes ever shot. The windmill scene. Oh. Same thing with the, the Dracula um, people trying to stomp mm -hmm. down his door as he's trying to, to take a Mina. Um, both of them are just great endings. They're great films. They really stand the test of time. I agree. I, I think the climaxes are both good but for different reasons i think uh, as we said with uh the frankenstein film it is it's definitely a monster it's not going to end well for him and um, yet you still kind of want it to even even after everything that's happened you still feel for this guy so i think the ending definitely works on on that film because of uh, the ride that you've gone through with, with this character. I mean, um, obviously, the difference between Frankenstein, the monster, and uh, Dracula is Dracula knows what he's doing. This has been his plan for years and years and years, where, while, well, yeah, the monster might have been a crook or a murderer or whatever, he's dead. He didn't have to get woken back up, so to speak. So, um, two interesting films, two classic and wonderful performances and uh, if you call yourself a horror fan or a classic horror fan and you've not seen these two movies you have pretty much done yourself a major disservice in the eyes of uh, us two yeah I mean, if you're a film lover um, person that really wants to see where all these cliches come from go watch the originals they're they're really legit um, obviously we mentioned you have to do a little adjusting in your mind to get into it. Don't expect your modern sound capturing devices or anything like that. But once you get past that and you get into the whole atmosphere, it's great. Let me say, um, as we close, because I know you didn't mention in the script, but I do. I, I think we can't talk about these two movies and not talk about what um, another filmmaker did when remaking these two films in his own right. And mm -hmm. if you're listening to this show, you know that we are fans of a certain director. And that certain director is Mel Brooks. And he has parodied 
both of these films. And I personally think, well, um, one of them is probably one of his best. The other one I think is overlooked a lot. And I think we should mention them, man. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, Young Frankenstein, Dracula Dead and Loving It, they're great. They play homage or homages to these two films. And you can tell that he as a filmmaker really loved these films and wanted to do his best to, to make sure they stayed in people's memories. Yes, definitely. And what I love about Dracula Dead and Loving is that it honors both the Bram Stoker uh, movie that came out and the old film. So it kind of does them both a little bit. And I think Leslie Nielsen is just fantastic in this film. While Peter Boyle plays Frankenstein's monster and the late great Gene Wilder is the grandson of Victor Frankenstein who pretty much does the same thing. Um, so it's sort of the sequel, but uh, both fa great films. Um, if you're a fan of both of these films and have not seen either of those Mel Brooks classics, do yourself a favor and watch these because they're as funny as they are as good as the original counterparts. Definitely. So stamp of approval, universal classics, Mel Brooks, they're mm -hmm. all great. Our next film that we're talking about is also a great one, and I, I paired this one with these in our watching this week um, because obviously it's another Dracula film, but it is completely different, completely yeah. different level, completely mm -hmm. different vibe. Uh, it's Bram Stoker's Dracula, or some people call it Coppola's Dracula. <laughs> uh, it's probably his last great film he ever made, and mm. I can't wait to talk about that one. Well, so stay tuned for that, guys. Um, really do appreciate you guys joining us on this double feature episode. Uh, we are just getting started with the month of October. We have got a lot of great things to talk about, uh, a couple surprises. So just enjoy, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys on our next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Supercast. We release these twice a week, so if you want to stay up on things, check out our Facebook group and our Twitter. We're very active. We'd like you to be active too. So find us Supercast spelled with a Z. Also, stay tuned to YouTube where we do live streams and stuff like that. Just like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for listening to the Supercast.